Good afternoon, everybody, or good evening, good morning, depending on where you are. Um, my name is Cassie, and I just want to welcome you to another EI Live K-12 session for students and educators. Um, really, really glad uh, to have everyone here today. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Earth Institute and are joining us for the first time, um, our core mission is to foster a greater understanding of the science behind the climate crisis um, and what we as global citizens can do. Um, experts that make up the Earth Institute um, include economists, business and policy experts, uh, specialists in public health, and of course, Earth, uh, Earth and environmental scientists. Um, the Institute is actually made up of more than two dozen or so research centers um, and several hundred people who collaborate across many different departments and disciplines at Columbia University. What we're hoping to do with our EI Live K-12 sessions is to introduce you to some of that interdisciplinary work through our experts. Uh, we're going to have these sessions weekly until the end of June. And if you'd like any additional information about upcoming sessions, feel free to email me directly. Uh, today, we are very lucky to have Jackie Osterman from Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory, which is the largest research center that's part of the Earth Institute. She's going to be speaking to us about her research work um, and particularly um, what you can learn about uh, ice sheets from rocks in the Bahamas, which is probably not the first place you think about uh, when you think about uh, learning things about ice and ice sheets. So Jackie will do her presentation and throughout the session, if you do have questions that come up, please use the Q&A box. That's what we're monitoring today, and we will be sure to get to all of your questions. Uh, Jackie may also type in uh, answers to questions or address them as we go. Um, but if you do have questions, feel free to pop it in that uh, Q&A box. And as always, these are being recorded, um, and we'll be sharing the recording along with additional uh, resources and readings um, after the session. So Jackie, whenever you're ready, you can, if you want to take it away. Awesome. Thanks so much, Cassie. Um, well, welcome, everyone. I'm very excited to be here today and to talk to all of you a little bit about um, the work that I do and the research that I do that all focuses about on sea level change. I noticed now when Cassie was introducing me when I was looking at my slide again that this title does actually not have the word sea level change in it, which is quite unusual for titles of my presentation. So I'll be talking about what we can learn about how much ice sheets are melting and how much sea level is rising by looking at rocks, essentially. I'm, um, as Cassie said, I'm an assistant professor at Lamont and um, my background is in physics. So I'm referred to as a geophysicist. So I study the earth and I study the physics of the earth. Um, and um, kind of halfway through under, after my undergraduate degree, I decided to, to veer towards the earth sciences and have, ha have really enjoyed working on this um, since. So today I will, talking about, I will be talking about um, sea level change and specifically sea level rise. And of course, this is a topic that is um, very relevant today, especially if you live in a place like New York City where sea level rise and nuisance floodings are already taking place and affecting the city on a daily basis. Um, so here are just some images from um, the New York City area um, of regions that um, are in very low lying areas where flooding occurs quite frequently. Um, if you've been in New York City for a while, you might have been here also during some of the bigger hurricanes. Um, and extra and um, storms such as Sandy, of course, that had a storm surge of um, many meters and caused significant flooding and affected the infrastructure. And so for coastlines around the world and especially cities like um, New York City, understanding how much sea level will rise is really crucial. And that motivates a lot of my work. So let's have a look, stay, let's stay in New York City a little bit and have a look at what the predictions are for future sea level change. Um, so what I'm showing you here is a graph that has time on the x-axis. We're going from 1900 to 2100. Um, and we're looking at sea level change here in feet or in meters, whichever unit you prefer. Um, and this is a measurement here of how sea level has sort of slowly been creeping up in New York City um, by about a feet 
about a foot over the last um, century. And this is a record from a tight gauge station in Battery Park. It looks like this. If you're down there someday, keep an eye open for it. Um, and so we have a record of how much sea level has risen in New York over this time period. In addition, we also have predictions of how much it will rise in the future. And I'm showing you here a, um, a few projections of this change. So I'm showing you predictions of how much sea level will change by 2020, 2050, 2080, 2100. And these boxes and, and whiskers refer to sort of what a likely range of how much sea level will, will rise. So anything within the box is sort of, that's sort of the likely estimate of how much sea level will rise. So for example, uh, here for in New York City, and by, by the 2050s, um, sea level will probably be around half a meter higher or two feet higher than it is today. And these whiskers up and down show you also kind of possible ranges of how much it might also be a little higher or a little lower than that. And then towards 2100, it's more a, a meter or three or a little over three feet or even up to two meters, six to seven feet of sea level rise. So that's obviously a significant amount of sea level rise. Um, in addition to that, there are some of these outlier scenarios that have been um, suggested that sea level might rise even more. And these are referred to as upper end low probability sea level rise scenarios. So those are um, very high, three meters, oops, three meters, so nine to 10 feet of sea level rise, and they have a very low probability. So it's not very likely that this will actually occur, but if it does occur, it's, it's very devastating for the city. So for economists and city planners, these kind of scenarios, even if they are unlikely to happen, just the chance that they might happen is really important to take into account. So the work that I do tries to better understand where are we in this range of 30 centimeters to three meters, where is reality gonna lie? And in particular, thinking about these actually, these um, high-end, possible high-end scenarios that would likely be driven by melting of polar ice sheets or by an increased melting of polar ice sheets. So just to give you a little bit more context for New York City, um, this is a scenario. So we're looking at a map of New York City here um, and we're looking at kind of the areas that would be flooded if sea level rose by a foot or three feet. And you see a lot of the areas that are very low lying would be significantly affected by that or by 10 feet. And so these are of course, of course, huge areas of the city. So knowing, knowing whether we have to prepare for a three feet or 10 feet is a pretty significant difference. And we're trying, we're hoping that we can sort of narrow this range of uncertainty. Now, what causes the sea level rise? If you wanna understand better, what is the range of sea level rise? The first um, question we need to answer is what even causes the sea level rise? And there are different drivers today. Um, thermal expansion of the oceans, so the oceans warming up and therefore increasing in volume um, causes a significant amount of sea level rise. Another contributor, and the one that is a lot more uncertain as we go forward in time, is how much ice, major ice sheets like the Arctic ice sheet and the Greenland ice sheet will contribute to sea level rise. And those major ice sheets, we're looking here at Antarctica, which is of course on the South Pole. Um, these ice sheets have been losing um, mass at increasing rates. So here's an area in, so this part of Antarctica is Western Antarctica and big areas here, everything that shows up in red are areas where ice is lost and mel uh, melts and contributes to sea level rise. Blue areas are areas where the ice sheet is actually gaining mass. But on a whole, the Antarctic ice sheet has, I'm just going to play this again, has lost um, uh, mass, which means it has contributed to sea level rise. And coming back to these stars, these low, high-end, low-probability scenarios, 
those are really related to um, the big ice sheets and knowing, okay, how quickly do they collapse? Um, and how, if we just increase temperatures by one degree or two degrees or three degrees, how, where is a threshold in the ice sheet that causes um, them to collapse? And that's what we wanna better understand. Yeah, okay. So the way, there are different ways of how you can answer that question, right? How much do ice sheets contribute to sea level rise in the future? You can um, set up a physical model of the ice sheet and make predictions of that going forward in time. But there's a lot that we just don't know about the physics of ice sheets. So, and still, this is a very good approach, but the approach that I'm going to be talking about is a different one. And that is, we're going to go back in geologic time. We're going to use the Earth as our experiment. And we're going to go back to times in Earth's history when temperatures were naturally warmer than today. So the Earth has existed for four, four and a half billion years, and a lot of things have taken place on Earth. Temperatures for most of the time of Earth's history were actually warmer than they are today. Um, and we've had sort of a cooling of the Earth into the, present, uh, into the present day. And we have large variations currently in temperatures with big, big ice ages and what is referred to as interglacial times where the ice sheets are smaller, um, which is a cur the current time that we're in. Um, and what we can do is we can go look for sort of analogs in the past. We can go back to times when temperatures were one degree, two degrees, three degrees, et cetera, warmer than they are today. And those are really good testing grounds for us to understand how sensitive ice sheets were to warming in the past. And therefore, hopefully, we will learn something about how sensitive they're going to be to warming in the future. Um, so we're going to answer this question by looking at the last time in geologic history when Earth was warmer than today. And we have to go back 125,000 years to a time period that is referred to as the last interglacial. And in terms of geologic time, this is actually pretty recent. I know this sounds like a long time ago, but if you're a geologist and if you, if you generally think about millions and tens of millions and hundreds of millions of years, right? That dinosaurs existed or went extinct 65 million years ago. So this was very long time ago. We're looking at something that is pretty much just yesterday in, in geologic terms, but it was 125,000 years ago. So 125,000 years ago, temperatures were slightly warmer than they are today. And I found this plot recently and it's very busy, but we're gonna look at this for a stare at this for a moment, um, because I think actually it is really interesting and conveys a lot of really important information. So what are we looking at here? We are looking at time at the x-axis here. We are today at, well, move the chat. Um, today we are around here. Um, and you see that this, the time axis here is not linear. Here this is 200, each tick mark is 100 years. Then this is KYR as kilo years, thousand years. So every, here we go from 10,000 years to 20,000 years. Then we go from 300,000, 200,000, 300,000 years. And back here, MYR is millions of years. 1 million years, 3 million years, 20, 40. So the time spans get bigger and bigger. Um, and what we have on the y-axis here, what's actually plotted is temperature. So this is how warm temperatures were in the past and how warm they might get again in the future. Um, so we start here and we go back and we try to find times that were warmer than today. And during this time, which is the last ice age, temperatures were a lot colder, but then we go back to this time here. And this is LIG, it's the last interglacial. This is the time period, 125,000 years that I'm gonna take you to. Um, we can also go back to older and older times when temperatures were warmer and warmer and try to reconstruct sea level then. And a lot of my work does, deals with that as well. But today I'm gonna talk about this time period. 
So temperatures on Earth during this time period were about one to two degrees warmer than pre-industrial values. So today, you see this in this little curve here, today temperatures are, have already been rising because of the CO2 emissions, the greenhouse gas effect. Um, so temperatures relative to this baseline, this dashed line here, about one to two degrees, depending on which, um, which reconstructions you look at warmer than today. And this is, um, this, these warmer temperatures were not related to humans being around and emitting a lot of CO2, which is the reason why we're seeing warmer temperatures today. But there in the past, it's related to how the Earth has orbits around the sun um, and had higher insulation. So more solar energy reached the Earth during this time period, leading to slightly warmer temperatures. So what we want to do is we want to reconstruct how high sea level was during this time. Okay, so here's the approach. We know sea level is rising due to rising temperatures um, and melting ice sheets contribute to this rising sea level. So what we can do is we can reconstruct sea level in the past when temperatures were warmer than they are today. And that hopefully tells us some things about how ice sheets respond to have responded to past warming and therefore will again respond to future warming. So that's the approach that my research takes. And I'm going to walk you through this now, this last, this third step here, which is how can we reconstruct sea level that, how, how can we find out how high sea level was 125,000 years ago? Even though I said, you know, for a geologist, this is almost yesterday, but of course, this is a long time ago. Um, so how do how can we get at that? And now is where I take you to the Bahamas. Um, so we will try, we will look at how we can reconstruct sea level during this time period by um, looking at geologic archives in the Bahamas. The Bahamas are an, uh, an island chain in the Northern Caribbean here. If we zoom in a little bit more, we have Florida here, just the Southern tip of Florida. We have Cuba here. And the Bahamas is this island chain across here. Um, you see, of course, every anything that's land is in kind of green and brown. Um, and these areas in turquoise are areas that are very shallow um, topography. So those are below sea level, but they're very shallow. Um, and this is what sort of an aerial photo looks like and what you might think of when you think about the Bahamas which is that you have these very shallow islands. They don't have a lot of topography. There's not a lot of mountains on them. A lot of these islands, the highest place on the island is maybe 10 meters, 15, 20 meters above sea level. But they're very flat islands. And also the topography under the water, which is sort of in, which, which um, leads to this really nice turquoise, beautiful ocean. Um, is very shallow. So you have very long beaches, both on the land side and then in the submarine side. So what we, um, how we reconstruct sea level during the past is that we look for different fossils or specific landforms that give us clues about how high sea level was in the past. So let me show you some examples of those. The main, the first kind of clue that we generally look for are corals, fossil corals. So corals that were once alive and that were alive during this time period of the last interglacial and that then fossilized and are still preserved in the rock record today. So that essentially turned into rock and are preserved in the record today. So here on the right is a living coral. This is referred to as, or this is called a brain coral because it kind of looks like a brain. And on the left-hand side here, you see the fossil equivalent um, of this coral. So this coral was alive 125,000 years ago, and it is dead now. But what did this fossil tells us is that when it was alive, sea level was higher than this elevation of the coral during that time, right? Corals don't grow on land. 
Corals only grow in, in the ocean. So sea level must have been higher than the elevation of this coral. And a lot of the species um, actually uh, grow very close to sea level. So you see this as well here, very close to the sea surface. The sea surface is just here, um, especially if you have big extensive reefs, they generally just grow a couple of meters below the sea surface. So they're really good tracers of where sea level was in the past and we can take advantage of that. So this is one example here. This is another type of coral. This is referred to as an elkhorn coral because it kind of looks like the anthers of an elk. Um, again, here on the right, you see the living coral that you might find in the Caribbean today. And then here on the left, you, it's a little harder to see, but you see these kind of big elk, elkhorn coral leaves um, that were, are fossilized. Um, and that, again, this one dates to the last interglacial, so 125,000 years ago. And here's the third example of a coral. Uh, this is a staghorn coral. And you see here the different bits of that staghorn coral actually kind of ground up and mixed. You, and you see some other types of corals in here as well. So corals are good because we know they, they were below sea level when they grew. They were probably pretty close to the sea surface. And here's the third aspect of it that makes corals really great um, tools to reconstruct sea level is that we can actually take little pieces of them, take them back into the lab and use um, and, and date them so that we can actually know exactly when this coral was alive. And we can tell that up to a few hundred years, maybe a thousand years. So we can tell you that this car was alive 125,000 years plus minus 500 years plus minus a thousand years. But that's pretty precise given that so long ago. So that's one of the big advantages of these, what's referred to as sea level indicators. This is a type of sea level indicator. Okay, there are a couple of other features that we can look for. Um, for example, notches. So on the right, again, you see a present day notch that forms just at sea level. The, the wave energy eats into the rock and erodes the rock. And on the left, this is in the Bahamas. All of these pictures are in the Bahamas. We see this notch. This We find this notch today, three meters above present day sea level. And this notch was very likely carved out by the ocean energy whenever the sea surface was at this level. So we can put our finger at where sea level was at the past, in the past. This feature is a little harder to date. So to get an exact age of when this forms is a little more difficult, but it's another clue, clue for the elevation of past sea level. Here's another example. This might be the last. Um, on the right here, we see these ripples in the sand. And we know we are pretty much at sea level at, in, um, if we see these features. Okay. And on the left, down here, you see, you see kind of the lower parts of these ripples are filled in with modern sand, beach sand, which is a little lighter in color. And this little darker in color are sort of the top ridges of these ripples. And so the, these ripples were preserved and essentially just cemented in place. So at, again, these are date to the same time period. Um, this, the, this sea level was at this elevation and then um, these ripples just cemented and turned into sedimentary rock um, and, are, and preserved a level, a meter stick of where sea level was during this time period. Oh yeah, here's the last one. This is the last one, yeah. Um, one more type of sea level indicator um, and those are caves, sea caves. Some people use records in, um, in the caves as well. Here on the right, you see this sea cave that forms just at present day sea level. Essentially the bottom of the cave marks where present day sea level is. And on the left, you see this cave here and you actually see a second cave system on top of it. Um, so this is another system and sort of puzzle piece that we can use to put together and understand past sea level. 
Okay, so I'm gonna kind of walk you through the steps. So we want to understand how high sea level was during the last interglacial. Here's a 10 step guide to how you do field work in the Bahamas and what you find out about the elevation of sea level um, from it. So step one is make a plan of where to go. Um, in the Bahamas, for example, there aren't actually a lot of geologic maps. Um, so we know we are looking for fossil corals, we're looking for notches, um, we're looking for sea caves and all of these features, but there's no treasure map that tells us where we can find any of these. So we have to kind of figure out and from, from the topography and from some of the initial geologic maps of these islands, we have to figure out, okay, where might we find these different clues? and go and probe and look around. Well, which takes me to two, probe and look around. Step two is walk along the coastline a lot, because as, we, as I said, we don't actually know exactly where we can find these fossil corals and we need some context, some geologic context first. So a lot of the work actually consists of walking along the shoreline and I don't know if you can see us on this picture, but this is us here walking along the shoreline. Step three is find a fossil coral, a notch, or any other sea level indicator um, that tells you something about how high sea level was at this location in the past. Step four is take a lot of notes. Um, I have actually, I told you before, I'm, my background is uh, in physics, so I haven't done a ton of field work. So um, definitely I have to learn of taking better notes and more notes, um, but yes, take documenting what you're doing. When you're at the site, um, in addition to documenting what you're doing, taking samples. So these are samples of little pieces of these corals. I told you before that corals are great because we can date them and get a pretty precise age of when they were alive. And so we can take little, little pieces um, to take back into the lab and obtain those ages. We want to measure the exact elevation, right? We want to infer how high sea level was. So elevation of these features is really crucial for us. So we take a super high precision GPS, which is, this is the, the antenna, essentially. This just has kind of a GUI that has the software application on it. Um, and it measures essentially the elevation of the bottom of this meter stick. So we get very precise elevation. In addition to elevation, ideally we don't want just elevation from one point, but we want a full 3D model of this whole area that we are mapping. Now it's very hard to find these fossil cars. And so once we, have an, um, an area where we found them, we want to document as much information as we can so that when we go back into, you know, come back to New York, we can look at those um, pictures again, we can find these clues and puzzle pieces and put them together to reconstruct sea level. So what we do is we take a ton of pictures, often from a drone, like you see here, and we can use what's called photogrammetry which essentially links all of those pictures together and turns them into a 3D model of the outcrop. And this is an example here. So it's a 3D surface that's just based on measuring kind of a, a few ground truth points and then linking all of these photos together and we can revisit the outcrop once we're back in the lab. Um, you can also put on augmented reality goggles and actually walk through the outcrop again once you're back. And that's also has been really cool. Step nine, we're almost there, is when you're back in the lab, it's analyzing the samples, um, providing and getting good age constraints. So actually knowing exactly how all of these different sea level indicators are is the most important part in that analysis and the lab analysis. Um, and this is done in big machines like this one. And then here's the one last step, and that's a tricky one. And that's actually the one that I, a lot of my work focuses on. And that step is, okay, now we have, we left with 
We know how high sea level was. We have all these puzzle pieces in place. Sea level was three meters above present. Um, and we know it has a really good, we have, we have the specific age from dating our coral. Now, what we need to know is we, we don't necessarily want to know how high sea level was at this specific location in the Bahamas, right? We want to know how high was sea level on average during this time, because in any given location, sea level can change if ice sheets melt and if the, therm the oceans expand. But sea level can also change if this location that you're on, like the Bahamas, New York City, if there the solid earth is going up, is uplifting over time or is subsiding over time. So the land level can change and it actually does change significantly so over thousands of years. And we need to calculate how much that is changing and we need to correct that because we don't wanna know how, how much the land's going up and down. We wanna know how much is actually sea level going up and down. So we need to make that correction. Um, and one of the reasons that the land is going up and down is actually related to the ice sheets um, uh, themselves. So when big ice sheets form, like during the last big ice age here, um, we had big ice sheets over in the North, Northern North America, Northern Europe, um, they press down on the surface of the earth and the areas around it are uplifted and the areas underneath the ice sheet is depressed and subsides. As the ice sheet melts, oops, as the ice sheet melts, you have the opposite effect. This area is rebounding and the areas around the ice sheets are subsiding. And those are, those are some of the effects that we need to take into account in order to actually back out sea level change on average and not just in this one location. Okay, so we have done all of this for the Bahamas. We followed the 10 steps. And what we have found is that sea level was at least two meters higher than today um, during the last interglacial. So here's a time period from 128,000 years. This is thousand years again on the x-axis to 120, 20, 117,000 years. So this is just the time span of the last interglacial. And here's the sea level. Um, and the most likely value is in the thick black line. Then you see sort of still possible is in this thinner black line band. And then even less likely, but still possible is in your dashed black lines here. So this gives you the whole range um, of, of um, possibilities, but likely um, it is likely. So this thick curve that it was at two meters and it could have even been higher up to four meters um, higher than today. So what does two meters, four meters, what does that mean if we think in terms of ice sheets? So I wanna give you a little bit of a sense of this. So here I'm showing you the two major ice sheets today that exist, which is the Greenland ice sheet here and the Antarctic ice sheet. And the numbers, that are on these ice sheets are the, is how much sea level would rise on average if this ice sheet were to melt. So if the Greenland ice sheet melts today, then sea level in the oceans would rise by about seven meters. So that gives you a sense of scale of, if I say sea level was two meters higher or four meters higher during that time period, that means that the Greenland ice sheet was possibly only half as big or the Western Arctic ice sheet here might have been significantly smaller than it is today. And this estimate of two to four meters sea level being higher than it is today, we don't know whether it comes from Western Antarctica, whether it comes from Greenland, and more, more work needs to be done um, on this. But it gives us a first clue about how sensitive to just half a degree, a degree of warming, these ice sheets might be. And with that, I just kind of want to zoom back out and start to wrap up. So I talked about the last interglacial here. Um, yeah, the last interglacial here is this time period that was a little bit warmer and sea level was a little bit higher, well, a few meters higher than it is today. Um, but there are other time periods that people study and try to understand how high sea level was as temperatures were warmer and warmer. 
And this is kind of a nice overview graphic here that shows you in different times today, the last interglacial here, and then earlier and earlier time periods. And it shows you how that they were warmer and warmer. Again, we looked at the last interglacial here about a degree warmer or so than pre-industrial values. And it also gives you a sense of how high sea level was, which is on here in blue. And one thing you will note here is that in this study, they, and actually also in some of the big reports like the IPCC report that might've heard about, sea level was six to nine meters higher than today. So I said two to four is what we found. Well, they found six to nine meters, which is very different. And that's where this field of research is at. We don't know this yet. We're still kind of narrowing in on how exact, how much higher exactly sea level was, but probably by meters higher than it is today with really only a very small amount of warming. And with that, I'm just gonna go quickly through these take home messages that sort of build up, build on what I already told you before. Um, sea level is rising today due to rising temperatures, which cause the melting of ice sheets and those contribute to those rising sea levels. What we can do is we can reconstruct sea level in the past, like in places uh, like the Bahamas, for example, um, and focus on time periods when temperatures were warmer than today to understand how susceptible these ice sheets are to warming. What we found in the Bahamas is that sea level was a few meters higher than it is today. And really temperatures were only slightly warmer than they, because temperatures have already risen over the last decades. So if temperatures were to stay pretty much constant, maybe a half a degree warmer than today for some time for the climate system to equilibrate, we would probably see a significant amount of sea level rise. And of course, in reality, temperature will probably continue to rise as we are emitting more and more CO2. Um, so this is only one step along this kind of increasing temperatures. And therefore more work is needed to get that bigger picture of how high sea level was for warmer and warmer past temperatures and therefore also future temperatures. And with that, I'm gonna finish off here. Thank you so much for participating and I'm really excited to answer any questions. I see there are some questions in the Q&A already. Um, I'm ha very happy to talk more about this or anything you might be interested in. So thanks so much. Great, thank you so much, Jackie. Um, so we will, what we're gonna do is switch uh, gears a little here. We have a colleague um, here from NASA's uh, Goddard Institute of Space Studies, uh, Rosalba, and she's going to share um, a couple of resources that are relevant from NASA. Um, Jackie, if you can stop sharing, mm -hmm. we'll have Rosalba, great. And Jackie, if you wanna um, take a look at those questions, you can answer those live right after uh, Rosalba is, is done sharing her resources. So Rosalba, whenever you're ready. Thank you. Can you see my slide? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, thank you, Cassie. Uh, yeah, my name is Rosalba. I help support NASA's Office of STEM Engagement at the Goddard Institute for Space Studies. And I am happy to have the opportunity to share a few supplemental resources. So today I want to highlight Climate Kids my NASA Data's Earth System Data Explorer, and Earth Now. So first, uh, Climate Kids, like the name implies, it's uh, developed for kids. It's a website with articles, visuals, games, um, activities to learn about Earth's climate. There is a section that has to do with sea level. It's called Planet Health Report Sea Level. So definitely uh, a website that I suggest to explore. Um, then the second one, my NASA Data Earth System Data Explorer. So this is a visualization tool that allows you to interact with satellite data. And you can make your maps, you can make charts, graphs, and plots. The one that I, I'm highlighting here is about seafloor sediment data. 
So this data is based on more than 200,000 ocean sediment samples taken by scientists from 1885 to 2014. So it's, um, you can see here part of the Atlantic Ocean. And so it shows you, for example, um, samples that can have mainly ash and volcanic sand or fragments of corals or shells and so on. I will uh, put, if, if I have, um, if it is possible for me to send the, the links in the chat, I will. Um, so I will try to do that after I share the next resource. And also the links to these resources will be on the Earth Institute website. So again, Earth System Data Explorer lets you interact with many different data sets. This is just one of them that is related to today's topic but there are many other data sets. On that website, there are video tutorials um, so that you learn how to use it. And then the third resource is called NASA Earth Now. So this is a pretty cool app. It's very interactive. Um, it shows you real-time global satellite data for many different vital signs of our planet, like carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, um, air temperature, and of course sea level. So the map that I'm showing on the screen is about sea level. The app can be accessed on your browser or you can also download it to Apple or Android devices. And so on the screen, the map that I have is showing this month's sea level difference from the average over the last month. So the yellow and the red areas indicate regions of sea levels greater than average. The green shows um, you know, like not change compared to the average, and then uh, blue and purple is lower than average. And those are the resources. I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and I'm going to try putting the links to these um, resources on the chat. And that's it for me. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Rosalba. Um, you should be able to, to put things in the chat um as a panelist so back to jackie so we have two open questions here um, for those of you who are still on if you would like to ask a question please type it into the q a box um, so jackie we can start in the order that is here um, so what are some of the common mistakes um, in the photogrammetry steps and what measures or points of caution do you have to give us from your I love the 10 step guide. <laughs> I think it, it lays it out so well. So I'm really glad that you you did that. So what are what are some best practices you've learned? Yeah. So for the photogrammetry where you essentially take a bunch of pictures and then turn it into this 3D models, there are two important aspects, I guess. One is that the different photos that you take, um, you want to take, they should have a lot of overlap, like 70%, 80% overlap so that they can actually be kind of fitted next to each other. And ideally you take them from different angles so that you actually detect sort of 3D shapes. Um, and then the other important aspect is that you need to measure different um, points with that GPS antenna so that you can actually in your 3D model say, okay, this location is at five meters and this longitude latitude, this location is at six meters elevation and this longitude and latitude. So generally we do five points. Um, and you do those at different elevations also so that you have a good sort of spread. So those are sort of the things to look out for um, when making these models to actually produce good models. Um, the other question, if I may follow up on that. <laughs> um, so thanks so much about that for that question. It's really actually really fun and to see in, in a live event, we normally, as I said, have like the augmented um, reality goggles and people can actually walk through the outcrop, which is always really fun. Um, the other question is how much sea level rise can be attributed to land rise? And that's a very good question. So generally, um, if the land is rising, um, you will actually see a sea level fall, right? Or if the land is lowering, you will see a sea level, uh, sea level rise. So in New York City, so how much land rise or land level changes contribute to sea level change? Um, depends on where you are. 
in some places like New Orleans, for example, where the area that you're on is essentially a delta and it's compacting, the land is actually actively subsiding and you see pretty large rates of sea level rise that are mostly attributed to this land level change. Um, and as only a smaller contribution, it comes from ice melt and, and sea level rise. In New York City, I think it's about a third of, this, of the sea level rise that we are seeing is because the land is also subsiding. And that has to do with what I briefly mentioned, actually what happened during the last ice age, these big ice sheets um, covered North America. As a result, New York and all of the US East Coast was higher. Um, and then the ice sheet melted and the New York and the West and the East Coast is sort of subsiding. And in places like North Carolina, um, half of the sea level rise that they are seeing is because of land subsidence and half is of because of sea level rise. So these can be pretty, so the land level changes are very, can be pretty significant, which also means that sea level changes are very local. We think about kind of ice melt and, and all of these global effects, but it's really a local problem. Different cities will experience very different amount of sea level changes. Um, and therefore also the strategies to deal with that sea level change will be very different from city to city. Um, yeah, so that's a really, really good question. Thank you for, for asking that question. And just to plug a future session, um, there's going to be another scientist from Lamont, um, Dr. Mike Kaplan on June 10th, is that he's actually going to talk about the large ice sheet that uh, once covered Manhattan, which is really hard to, hard to envision. And that one, um, that session, as I said, is taking place June 10th. So if that's a particular uh, topic of interest for you, definitely uh, join us for that session. Um, Jackie, you mentioned, um, you know, the, I'm, I'm going to take this opportunity to ask the, the last question. I don't see anything else, but I think, um, you know, your point about the importance of taking really good field notes. Um, I wanted to, to come back to that a little because that's something um, I know that a, a lot of our scientists and our um, educators who've been involved in various programs at Lamont have tried to do a lot of science journaling with students and, you know, highlighting the importance of these field notes. Um, you know, what, what can you tell us about about, you know your sort of experiences you know it's it's really you said it's really important um you know i think it's really uh, a it's a great skill and it's just a way of practicing different types of science writing you know you you write journal articles but then you also have to be really good at taking really quick notes so i'm curious if you could just comment on the maybe the different types of science writing that you do yeah definitely i mean i think it's just when you're in the field it's also present, you, you see yeah. it, it's like right in your head, you talk about it with your colleagues and it seems very, not necessarily clear, but it's all there and all in your head together. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's easy to just feel like, okay, I will, of course I'll remember this. Like I know this now, <laughs> this seems is very present, it's very clear. But then if you look at back at it a week later, a month later, a year later, it's not, yeah. <laughs> it's not in your memory anymore. And so yeah. really um, kind of forcing yourself to think that I <laughs> understand that you will forget all of yeah. this. So you really need to take notes um, and do sketches as well. Because as I was explaining, there are all these different sort of clues. Sometimes also only after you do some of the analysis, you will come back and understand some of the clues better. So putting as much information and sketches down as possible is. Is, is great. Also, actually, one example, one of our um, group members was working on some of this Bahamas work. She wasn't able to participate in some of the field work. So then also to pass on some of that information, having good notes is very useful. And so I wish I had taken better notes <laughs> and I will do that next time. <laughs> No, I think that's a that's a really great point that we don't often think of and like people are like, oh, you get to travel to such great places and see such great things. But then you're right when you're not uh, physically in that space anymore. It, it's very challenging to remember. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think we are, um, you know, I don't see any additional questions. So thank you so much um, to everyone who's joined us today. Um, Jackie, thank you so much for, for your time and for, for sharing a little bit about your work with us. I think it's fantastic. Thank you, Rosalba, for joining us. Um, and as I've mentioned, if you do have uh, questions, let us know. And if you would like to learn more about our future sessions, also um, get in touch with us. So Jackie, thank you so okay. much again.
Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. And thanks everyone for, for coming. Yeah. All right. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye.